It is my pleasure to welcome our uh, Dr. Ravindra Chingley as our Honorable Chairperson. Dr. Ch uh, Ravindra Chingley is an advocate of rec on record, the Supreme Court of India. He is also a registered patent and trademark agent of the Indian Patent Office. Dr. Chingley is also, is also practicing as an IP attorney with IP Nation. He is a visiting faculty for Indian Institute of Management, Rotak. Dr. Chingley has expertise in drafting of civil, criminal, special leave patent petition, argued civil and criminal matters. He has part of various lectures, workshops, and uh, conferences. Sir, it's an honorable, it's an honor to have you on board. And sir, before I hand over the session to you, I would like to mention the rules for the paper presenters. And that is, each paper presenter will be allotted a time of 15 minutes to present the papers. And uh, paper presenters, please do keep in mind to not exceed the time limit. And anyone, any paper presenter has any queries, please uh, raise your hand or mention your queries in the chat box. With this, I hand over the session to you. And sir, if you, for your ease of convenience, if you want me to call out the names of the parties, please do let me know, uh, please do let me know, sir. And sir, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. It just, um, I welcome all of you. Very good afternoon to you all. Um, what we will do that uh, presenter should start uh, their presentation. And I think there are three presenters, right? Or so we have uh, five presenters, sir. Five presenters. So how much yes, time sir. you're giving to each presenter? 15 minutes, sir, for each presentation. Minutes. So yes. I just request to each, uh, each of everyone who are presenting that they should stick with that uh, time and they should in start. Uh, they should introduce for, for themselves first, and they uh, I'll, uh, they should start their presentation. So, uh, Prakash, who is the first presenter? Sir, first up, we have Doctor Anu Lakshmi and Somia S J. So, who is go going to present? I'll just uh, request Doctor uh, Anu Lakshmi and uh, Anu Lakshmi Somia and Somia J. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you start your presentation. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Just, uh, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Yeah, sir. I'm, I'm Saumya. I'm going to present. I'm uh, uh, going to present the present here. Uh, not anyone. Anyone else? Me, ma'am, is here. So I am going to uh, present this paper. So uh, my I'm a research scholar at uh, Sri Ayappa College for Women uh, at Nagar College. So my topic is uh, climate change fiction. I'm, my topic is based on climate change fiction, and it is titled as Barbara Kingsover's Flight Behavior, the novel Flight Behavior as a Climate Change Fiction, or CLIFI. So before uh, talking about the novel, uh, I would like to uh, talk a few words about CLIFI. What is meant by CLIFI? We know our presentation, our seminar is based on climate change mainly. So this CLIFI is it is an abbreviated abbreviated form of climate change fiction or climate fiction. That means it, uh, this CLIFI, this abbreviation is first used in uh, 2000s, the beginning of 2000s. It is to it is used to describe or this CLIFI or climate change fiction. The, both these terms used to describe novels and movies about man-made climate issues. Historically, there are, a there are a number of literary works that deal with climate change as a natural disaster. In literature, especially novels are, are a good way to communicate the message in a comfortable and also in an engaging way. So climate change, uh, we know it's a controversial phenomenon. So because there is a lot of opinion from different persons and different uh, viewpoints. So it is, it is uh, like that. The same in the case of fiction too. There's a many, there's a lots of uh, controversy, controversy behind this climate change fiction also. Authors have to draw the complexities of climate conditions by drawing its impact on the characters of the novel. They are attributing the complexities of climate uh, climatic errors or climatic uh, issues by drawing the impact on the characters and uh, different characters in the novel. Most of the characters in climate fiction have uh, they have an ability to remember how the world is before uh, and after the climate change. There will be definitely a difference between the climate change uh, and the normal climatic conditions. So they these characters have that. Uh, or at least they have that ability to remember the um, before and after effect of these climate issues. Extreme weather changes, variation in precipitation levels, species migration, and extinctions are the major issues connected to uh, climate 
change. Uh, these are the major themes connected with this climate fiction also. In my presentation, I am talking about Barbara Kingsover's flight behavior as a climate change fiction. So, uh, this novel, Flight Behavior, is a prominent entry to the Clifer genre. In Flight Behavior, Kingslover embodies her unique way of converting scientific experiences into fictional insights. So, uh, Kingslover dares to tear the logging climatic convictions. Her exciting concern for the natural world is quite apparent in her many novels, especially in this uh, cli climate, uh, this uh, flight behavior. Uh, she visualizes an entertaining spectacle with the arrival of some monarch butterflies, butterflies uh, in the rural in a place called Tennessee, and uh, the people believe that it's a kind of uh, goat's uh, warning or something like that. But actually, it's uh, it is because of the climatic error. So dramatic damage has happened in that particular area. And uh, usually Clify in, uh, works consists of an emotional narrative that which helps the fiction a sensitive one to make the readers uh, to understand the climatic issues in a sensitive tone. There will be some emotional narrative also. And here the central character Delarobia Turnbo is a uh, is coming from a poor family and she is unhappy with her married life. And she, see, one day she decides to elope uh, from this uh, unhappy situation or this. Uh, what uh, his troubles in her life but on the way she uh, experiences so she she could see some uh, bright side of this butterflies and she decides to go back to her family and actually it was a sight of uh, butterflies it's a number of a lots of many number of butterflies were appearing together and it, it has appeared as a kind of forest fire and she thought she, at that time she thought that it's some one given by god and she decides to go back and uh, there are in many of the clarify uh, works there are some religious ideologies and that will help the readers to feel a kind of respect towards god along with the admiration towards nature Nature. So, gold and nature is uh, an equal thing, or we have to admire both, both of things. Delarobia takes the strange uh, look of strange appearance of these butterflies as some sort of warning by God, and uh, she decides to go back to her family life. Her impulse to commit an act of blind self destruction, that is, eloping with another man, is transformed to determination to live uh, a different life. Delarobia descends the mountain with a new self confidence and. Uh, our writer, King Sober, simultaneously cast the implication of biblical intervention in the description of Bellarobia's first encounter with the butterfly. It's, a very, it's very beautifully described in this novel, the encounter uh, with Bellarobia uh, and the butterflies. Many clarify works revolve around uh, religion and science. There, we can see a conflict between, between religion and science in many of the clarify uh, works. When natural disasters appear, usually people believe that it is some curses given by God. Actually, they deny the, uh, the real reasons behind the natural disasters. Actually, the natural disaster is caused by the human beings themselves. But they believe that some kind of curses given by God. There is no connection with uh, human activities. In flight behavior, everyone, including religious fundamentalists and the environmentalists, frame the phenomenon to suit their, their own interest. Uh, some media. Uh, uh, you use this opportunity to uh, make their uh, channel in a high rate one. They call Delarobia as the our lady of butterflies and they make it a viral news. And uh, uh, then at the same time, another character enters in the uh, novel who is Ovid Byron. He is a, a scientist and he uh, acts as a mouthpiece of uh, our writer uh, Barbara Kingsover. And Ovid Byron uh, is an exhaustive, exhaustive uh, scientific focus. His scientific focus provides an explanation to the distorted path of these butterflies. Actually, these butterflies are monarch butterflies. They are a separate uh, gene, these uh, monarch butterflies. So they change the sub change their path from the Mexican mountain site to uh, have a, uh, because they experience some climatic errors in their usual path. That is why they came in a huge number in that particular area. And the people believe that as, a, as some, uh, what, warning given by God and something like that. 
and the increase the why these monarch butterflies came to this area because the increase in the use of pesticides also affected their healthy existence so uh, people use a lot of pesticides to uh, enrich their agriculture so this also affected the butterflies above all global warming has brought changes in the weather patterns the northward spread of fire ants and the higher infection rate from parasites limit their flying ab ab ability so global warming is the major reason behind this change of path uh, of this uh, monarch butterflies and this caused some fire ants to change their uh, way of path and the other uh, some, and also some uh, what parasites some kind of parasites also uh, grow in huge number and they also limit the flying ability of these butterflies climate related factors are responsible for the butterflies normal migration pattern in the in this appalachian mountains they face they will face extinction if they are exposed to sub zero temperature delrobia understands that the butterflies presence is a symptom of damage of the earth earth fragile ecosystem and no any warning given by god it is purely our um, what mistreating towards the world or the uh, earth many climate fiction focus uh, focuses on one major character who is a, who is destined to be the leader or to uh, they are acting as the mouthpiece of the uh, writer the writer of the novel here byron this obed byron is the um, mouthpiece of the our writer and uh, uh, this byron is worried about the lack of public concern over climate change this is a major issue people know these are the there are many problems um, uh, happening in around us but we do not know the actual reason behind this climatic issues are the human beings themselves they uh, they do not have the awareness about it this uh, is a major thing and in delarobia's world of little hopes and thankfulness delarobia living in a very comfortable way now and there is no room for byron's pessimism she believed that uh, she can uh, make the people aware about the issue and she, uh, she can um, make them an ecocentric vision in the human beings thus uh, they can uh, watch uh, re uh, reincarnate this uh, climatic errors and uh, uh, provide a very natural world to these butterflies locating the narrative within a small no uh, close knit community king sober is able to show the disruptive effect of ecological events climate change skepticism underpins the majority of the community the people in further town this rural area consider the arrival of monarch butterflies as the rebirth of lords at the same time butterflies are irritating some others if we uh, just imagine there is a lots of butterflies if we, if we go everywhere there are a huge number of butterflies are following us so we can't move a little so uh, that will uh, that also um, uh, irritated the others also some people some believe that is a some kind of rebirth of god lerobia's uh, parents also believe that it's a they believe that butterflies is an object to uh, attract tourists Uh, it will help to uh, what renovate a tourism uh, because uh, people will come to see the butterflies and they can gather money out of it so many people uh, um, different people have different intentions behind this uh, this appearance of these butterflies king sober the writer is basically an environmentalist whose writings are mostly uh, didactic in nature like many eco critical works many eco critical most of the eco critical works are didactic in nature they are meant to teach people about some issues and eco criticism you know it teaches about literature and the environment in an interdisciplinary point of view in this novel also uh, we can say that eco criticism is a major thing uh, or major theory uh, carried out by barbara kingslover in flight behavior kingslover introduces um, uh, over byron to uh, make the people aware about the uh, issues of this global warming and uh, this novel uh, uh, flight behavior kingslover makes a punch, makes no punches in exposing the illiteracy of 
farmers and small town communities there is nothing connected with the illiteracy it is all about the understanding of the climatic issues there is nothing to connect with illiteracy and uh, awareness because if you understand the climatic errors are given by uh, ourselves that's needed there is no need of scientific uh, theories or scientific innovations to solve this issue or understanding the issues she nevertheless the writer nevertheless depicts her mental world with sympathy and understanding there is no role for sympathy and understanding and political and commercial interests are present in the background also how people using this opportunities opportunities in order to make their life more uh, worth Kitsovar focuses on the everyday worries of poor illiterate illiterate people. The novel mainly focuses on the normal people, the common poor people's uh, issues, uh, by uh, facing this uh, uh, global warming and other climatic errors. In a world uh, where they have little control, these people have delegated the responsibility to take decisions for the uh, other people also. People do not respond with equal seriousness to all issues with respect to the climate. We know that. If any issue happens, people do not respond equally for that issue. If corona happens, people have no, uh, no equal opinion towards that. Each have dif different opinions and different point of view, different stance for the for opposing this uh, idea. So here also, the cli for the climate change issues also, there are uh, different kind of response to uh, rep response given by the people. This is one of the difficulties faced by the writers of Clive. So uh, people won't take it in the real sense. They just read and leave it. So that's a major difficulty faced by our major climate uh, change writers. King Slover symbolically represents people's attitude with the help of characters. Uh, and their response to the uh, discovery of climate change in the village. They do not accept that their village have these and these issues. They believe, they like to believe that these are some uh, what, warning or uh, some uh, imagery is given by God and uh, they can live with that. There is no such problems. But this butterfly symbolizes some major issues coming to the village and they do not um, are willing to believe that issue. King Sober makes different analogies to structure the climate events in the novel. One is uh, Byron uh, and the other scientists who dedicate their lives to painstakingly building up knowledge about the process of change. The uh, solution is just to uh, give the people aware about it and uh, how to live their, live a different life, how to re-modify their, li their life pattern in order to help our Earth. And uh, uh, climate fiction, uh, normally, including this flight behavior, brings the limelight prominence, uh, varied yet prominent issues related to the climate issues. And flight behavior, uh, in flight behavior, religion appears in the form of denial. And because people take this religious belief as something to deny the actual reasons behind any issues. In an increasingly secular or materialistic world, the people of the feather town, uh, are suspicious of outsiders and everything uh, foreign. They cling to their traditional values. Their most voluntarily adopted clarification for the climate change is religious one. They believe that it is a, uh, it is something uh, of God, Lord's business. There is nothing connected with climate out the earth. And uh, King Slover's flight, this novel, is anxious about the reformed flight behavior of butterflies as an alarming sign of global warming. Actually, this is an um, what is a warning against global warming. When we read that novel thoroughly, we can understand that among uh, all these characters and among all these issues, we, we are uh, unknowingly knowing about the, uh, the issues of global warming. And it's an alarming sign for global warming. At the same time, it is a study of human flight behavior that shows the public's flight over reality. Public's oh, means the people, the every people have an have a tendency to flight away from the real situation or the reality. So here also people uh, try ties their maximum to deny the real reason, and they believe that it's something related to God only. And uh, mm, 
people deny the challenges the changes in the patterns of production and consumption to in response to climate change related issues they even like to cut down trees they do not understand cutting down trees is a major reason behind all these issues they think that uh, they need uh, trees to uh, trees for their logging business but they need rain also they do not understand that trees only uh, will help to get enough water and rain there so um the butterflies uh, about this monarch butterflies after many this uh, climatic errors they will die after every 6 weeks there some fly back to the south and uh, and assemble in their winter gathering place in the mexican area this symbolizes the fragile and temporary beauty of nature this monarch butterflies is symbolizes the fragility of nature if we do not take care of it take care of our nature it will definitely uh, distracted by themselves or by ourselves itself climate fiction um, mainly deals uh, with some moral Excuse stories me, ma'am yes um, i'm sorry to interrupt but uh, we have you have to cut short your session and cut your presentations because you've exceeded your time limit so ma'am could okay, you please okay, conclude okay. in a minute or two ah yes sir. sure sir sure sure thank you so uh, it's actually i am um, coming to the conclusion that it is uh, this uh, flight behavior is a climate change fiction and uh, it shows that uh, in every situation there is role for uh, teaching the community or the people here in literature also there are lots of works there are lots of novels which are help helpful to understand about the climatic errors and how we can change our life patterns and uh, how we can understand the reality of this climatic issues this is what our uh, writer barbara kingslover is doing by this um, novel uh, flight behavior thank you for giving me extra time sorry sir for exceeding the time limit sorry thank you it's okay ma'am no not a problem uh, next up we have ulak simon ulak simon may you have you please uh good afternoon esteemed panel presenters the title of my topic is aquatic pollution a legislative and judicial analysis on plastic waste management i'm pulak simon research scholar from nlu assam moving forward with my presentation a wave in an ocean is a beautiful sight but if it is with garbage and plastic bottles it is not a pl pleasing sight this is turning into a reality the lackadaisical attitude of dumping garbage in a larger picture reflects karma which bites ways bites back water has always played a crucial role in nourishing humanity more than 3 billion people either directly or indirectly are dependent for their means of income through it the life of water bodies dwell in nature the surface life which is visible to a human eye and the life beneath the water which can be termed as a marine world This marine world is exquisite with various species ranging from small to large and aquatic plants which is so vast that half of it is still unexplored the constant challenge for the marine ecological balance to survive does not limit to itself but expands its limit to affect the health of human life as well the constitution of india through article 21 talks about right to life which is infringed because of degrading human health that has become an issue of concern due to the various rise of waterborne diseases attempt to save the marine ecology for the first time can be dated back to 1982 when the united nation convention on law of seas was brought to force by the various member states the convention highlighted the agreement which defined the obligation and its duties imposed on the coastal nations to respect and utilize the marine ecosystem in 1995 india has become Uh, became a signatory to the convention and being a part of the unclosed treaty resolved various sea boundary disputes attempts by the indian legislature has been in protecting the environment of the country by drafting various legislations to protect the marine life uh, such as the uh, maritime zones of india act of 1976 the coast guard act of 1978 even though the legislations are being enacted but the growth of it is still limited to the outcomes deserved to protect the marine ecosystem a 2015 report by the united nation environment program mentioned that more than 0.6 tons of plastic waste are being discharged in the ocean 
from India, which makes India stand on 12th position among the 20 countries highly responsible for marine pollution. So this research paper will actually try to analyze and study the causes of marine pollution with measures taken to manage plastic waste and surge in plastic waste in COVID times. Also attempts to understand the legislations and policies in marine, marine ecosystems and judicial standpoint on plastic waste will be learned through it. The first chapter is about understanding the causes of marine pollution with special focus on plastic waste disposal. So research shows that more than 233 marine species have ingested plastic waste and the polluted plastic waste has even reached the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean. Also, the constant projects to build roads over rivers, oceans cannot be considered progress if the ignorance about the marine pollution is not taken due consideration. This is in precise a basic understanding of what is marine pollution. In precise, it is the direct or through indirect means the flow of toxic materials into the marine ecosystem, which pollutes the environment and the marine species, which gets affected by such human interference. India has a, India has a 7,500 kilometer long coastline shared with 13 states, 1,200 mini islands and big islands in and around its exclusive economic zone, which makes India unique and rich but a recent report from Energy and Resource Institute has drawn quite an attention to the level of increasing pollution in the coastline, which is a threat to the human and the marine life. It is the agricultural runoff and pollutants from industries, solid waste, oil spills, which has, which has actually deteriorated the marine environment, resulting in an extensive desolation of dissolved oxygen and microbial concentration levels. It is a necessity that at least five milligram per liters of dissolved oxygen is a prerequisite to a balanced, healthy, eco-sensitive maritime zone. A study conducted by the Central Pollution Control Board claims 302 contaminated rivers are polluted in a 2015 report, which increased to 351 reports, uh, rivers in 2018 by the Pollution Board. The pollution level of rivers is tested by checking the biochemical oxygen demand. Three states are contributing massively in polluting its rivers, which includes Maharashtra, Assam, and Gujarat. The most notable effort that can be seen by the central government is the 20,000 crore project to clean Ganga, which was a success or a failure is still disputed. The Indian rivers has been a constant carrier of plastic waste, apart from other pollutants. Earlier, a river was known to connect life but now it acts more into destroying life. The United Nations report states that the Indus River carries with it a whipping 1,64,332 tons of plastic debris to the ocean, whereas the Meghna Brahmaputra Ganga chain carries 72,845 tons of plastic debris to the ocean. The numbers are astound astoundingly huge, which brings a question to play as to what is the government doing to solve the irreparable, irreparable damage being done to the environment. The plastic waste, when deposited into ocean under the influence of the UV rays, strong winds and the water currents break down into smaller particles, which is known as microplast. And further, uh, it breaks down more that is termed as nanoplast. This leads to easy consumption of this plastic waste by the marine species, which is toxic to their health. Most developing countries actually lack the infrastructure to reduce and prevent plastic waste, such as sanitary landfills, proper waste management process, thus making the country less efficient. The constant marine pollution with the relevant causes is an alarm to all the states to take initiatives to stop plastic waste as soon as, soon as possible or, or, else the, or, or else the environment always gives back what it receives. The second chapter is about the judicial policies on protecting the marine pollution and the remedial legislative approach on plastic waste. There are a lot of legislations like the Indian Fisheries Act that uh, focuses on protecting the fishes, fishes against various explosives like dynamites, Indian Ports Act, where laws are related to the ports and shipments, Merchant Shipping Act of 1958, which uh, provides for control for pollution by ships, Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which provides for the provisions related to the protection of aquatic creatures, Water Prevention and Pollution of Control Act 1974, 
for control uh, for controlling the pollution which are land based maritime zones act 1976 for regularizing mari uh, marine ecosystem marine fishing regulation act 1978 it is for the coastal states to protect the fisheries around territorial waters forest conservation act of 1980 which protects the marine the biodiversity coastal pollution control series uh, uh, control series of uh, 1982 it is it introduced the uh, cpcb to track uh, data relating to marine pollution so there are more such legislations which are enacted for various purposes to serve the protection and promotion of coastal rights and limiting pollution but but just by enacting legislation is it enough plastic is a constant threat to the marine life but what it what has been done to tackle the issue is a point of concern the first attempt to bring a legislative in, uh, action in india to regulate plastic waste was the formulation of the recycled plastic manufacture and usage rules 1999 the rules regulate the use of virgin plastic and storing of food items it was later replaced by the plastic waste management and handling rules of 2011 the rules further modified itself to enact the 2016 rules which shifts the accountability to each and every citizen for uh, for improving proper waste disposal mechanism the rules widen its jurisdiction by not limiting to urban areas but also rural areas as plastic has reached such areas the initiative to collect back the plastic waste by the producer company was uh, they were given they they were, uh, the producer company was given the initiative to collect back the plastic effort was also initiated to construct road with plastic waste the new plastic waste management uh, and the amendment rules of 2021 aims at banning thermocol single use plastic bags ice cream sticks and added, and added some new definitions to it but in reality such rules and regulations will be of no use until and unless the people pledge themselves to stop the plastic uh, use there are various uh, judi uh, the judiciary also intervened with various developments being done around the plastic waste which includes the case of dharampal satyapal versus deputy commissioner of central excise it revolved around the direction given by the court to stop plastic uh, packets for packaging good cars tobaccos and uh, pan flavored masalas it is a welcome move to stop the plastic usage from the roots but to but to the contrary till day the government cannot stop single plastic usage even though attempts were being made to reduce it but the increasing rate of plastic usage uh, shows the reality the third chapter uh, of my research paper glimpses about the aquatic pollution and the covid-19 pandemic the pandemic has been a real roller coaster for each and everyone's life the spread of virus has been sweeping out uh, sweeping away with it many loved ones but in the process to save their lives diagnosis been conducted in the hospitals and medical centers were availed most of the hospitals ran out of beds due to the overcrowding of patients now the issue is when such huge amount of the diagnosis were conducted then a lot of medical waste were also generated like the pp kits mask and related medical waste so how was the waste being disposed the medical waste slowly became the new normal for the household as well household waste which is an issue because of the dumping of such waste in the drains and open water bodies which indirectly contributes to the aquatic and marine pollution as all the waste gets dumped into the rivers and subsequently to the oceans the the waste is not only limited to medical waste but can be seen in the food industries as well the revenue of zomato during the pandemic has doubled from its 466 crore in the financial year of 2018 to 2604 crore in the year 2020 the huge amount of turnout also included huge amount of plastic waste a survey conducted in 2018 pointed that 22000 tons of plastic waste was generated the amount of such plastic waste was double in 2022 and my fifth chapter is about judicial ruling of the plastic waste management in october 14 2020 national uh, green tribunal has directed the ministry of forest environment and climate change to file a report on the amount of plastic being imported from other countries to india the report said 900 900000 tons of plastic was being imported to india which is an added pressure on india as the plastic waste management is not up to the mark like the other countries the judiciary has sought help of article 21 48 and 51 g of uh, the indian constitution to address various environmental issues relating to clean water and environment in the case of narmada narmada bachao andolan it was held that the right to clean water is a fundamental right under article 21 of the constitution of india it is a basic necessity to sustain in this world which if denied will lead to grave injustice the delhi high court has also stated on various occasions on the reduced use of plastic as much as possible 
uh, in the case of all India Plastic Industries Association and others versus the government of NCT of Delhi, the court stated a blanket ban on plastic is not possible, but plastic manufacturers should go on for an alternative to plastic. In a celebrated case of Karuna Society for, uh, for Animal versus Union of India, it was held the right to life also includes right to enjoy pollution-free marine environment. And in my conclusions and suggestions, the paper analyzed the causes of marine pollution, the reasons which are the factors of accelerating the cause and the judiciary, which are passing judgments to protect the environment. But how far did we reach to protect the marine life to, uh, and right to clean water is a conclusion to be drawn out. The World Health Organization has stated that at present the world needs 89 million plastic medical mask, 1.6 million protective goggles, which is manufactured with uh, poly, uh, poly, uh, polypropylene. This will take nearly 500 years to degrade into the ocean. The single plastic use has turned to be a new added threat to the aquatic environment. The recent upsurge of biomedical waste has, uh, has, has shooted to very high numbers and the handling capacity to manage waste is limited due to which nowadays medical waste are being dumped in the rivers and oceans, which is a problem both for the human and the aquatic life. The NJT, uh, the National Gr uh, Green Tribunal, has taken Suomoto cognizance for the indiscriminately dumping of biomedical waste in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka as a pain-stricken fisherman had to encounter masks, syringe, blood bags, and various COVID testing kits in the rivers and its banks. India proactively joined the United Nations Clean Sea Campaign, which required to formulate a national marine litter policy as a first step, but it got halted due to the pandemic. Marine litter in oceans is a threat because as soon as the litter enters the ocean, we lack resources to clean up the litter. The World Wildlife Fund for Nature has also initiated the idea that all countries should join and focus on aquatic plastic pollution, as this issue cannot be solved only by one country, nor can it be solved overnight. The suggestions that are, there are like three suggestions that I want to give uh, that the research initiates through this pa uh, paper is that it is the duty of the government and various NGOs to make aware of the threat of plastic pollution on human and aquatic species as a crisis which may create future problems. Schools should include chapters on it, sensitize it through various programs and activities to reduce plastic use. Secondly, it is the duty of the various government concerned to double the uh, plastic waste management system through which plastic waste can be treated. Thirdly, strict panel laws should be initiated to the plastic manufacturers if the plastic produced by them is found in the marine ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Pulak uh, Simon. And next up, we have Dr. Swati and Mr. Mani Pratap. May we have you, please? Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to the resource person. Uh, I'm audible, academician, a scholar, yes, and uh, OK, uh, one and all. Firstly, I would like uh, to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizer of this two days uh, international conference uh, for this uh, uh, in, in environmental aspect uh, for giving this opportunity to me. I, Mani Pratap, Assistant Professor, Central University of South Bihar, on behalf of uh, Dr. Swati, Assistant Professor, AM Law College, and myself, uh, to present on the theme of effectiveness of ADR in settlement of environmental disputes. Here, uh, I would like to highlight certain problems, challenges of environment and environmental disputes, especially uh, through ADR mechanism. Uh, what are the scope of ADR uh, we can find out in environmental cases? If I uh, and we go for the you know, environmental data, uh, environmental crimes cases through NCRB data, it suggests uh, 48,000 cases were pending up to 2018. And just after uh, this 2021, it has crossed 50,000 cases. So 
accordingly uh, per day if ngt decides 187 cases then only it will take up to 33 years to decide the cases so here uh, 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 there are certain points whether we will go through to take the environmental disputes environmental cases and can we get effective remedy uh, there are uh, two magazines that is relevant for any uh, criminal justice system justice delayed justice denied justice hurried justice worried and here in that line effectiveness of the environmental crimes and their disposal is certainly uh, based upon when it is settled it is settled instantly in due reasonable time or after 33 year long period of time uh, we are in a phase where environmental matters are very crucial one day by day a uh, certain issues are arising and that is adding for like environmental challenges so we cannot wait for 33 years and here therefore uh, what are the pendency uh, we can just uh, look uh, uh, in forest and forest conservation matter still we have 90.2 percent uh, pendency of the court cases wildlife it is 93 environmental protection matters 97 percent uh air and water 97 percent cigarette and other tobacco it is 46.9 percent noise pollution it is 47.4 percent ngt it is 100 percent and environment and pollution related acts it is 60.7 percent that is still in trial level it has not reached in even uh, in the level of appeal or the final disposal and it all uh, if we go through uh, in totality it is more than 90 percent pending cases which is still in trial cases when we uh, we uh, go for the national green tribunal act that is basically the indian act and uh, before uh, this uh, National Environmental Tribunal Act and Appellate Authority Act was there of 1995 and 1997. But when we uh, go for the National Green Tribunal Act 2010, basically that is dealing with the environmental cases and they have the some primary jurisdiction as well as appellate jurisdiction. Here we find the matter as, are coming from the Water Prevention and Control Pollution Act 1974 and likewise Air Pollution Control Act and uh, the in Environmental Protection Act and we have uh, certain other cases from you know uh, like uh, wildlife matter uh, we have some cases of forest matter so here uh, if we go for the role of NGT whether NGT will succeed to deal with all cases, we have to find out the challenges, what are the year in environmental issues, as well as, as certain uh, other mechanism to reduce the cases. And therefore, uh, if we talk here uh, environmental problems, if we talk here the environmental challenges, certainly we have to see in the light of development because uh, development are inevitable and that is one kind of human right also so we cannot deny the development but in the context of UNDP uh, the recommendation that is giving some time time to time the human development index and here uh, we have environmental problem also and uh, when we go for this environmental problem and challenges, we need to address those issues. So here, uh, there are certain international document which is dealing with uh, this kind of things, but whether we have adopted the same in municipal law in every country, like we have one planet and there are different sovereign 
so if we talk about the sovereignty aspect we have not uh, divided the environment on the basis of sovereign uh, on the basis of because it is transboundary in nature so stockholm declaration uh, principle 21 and rio declaration 2 and we have some cases also which is talking about the pollution environmental pollution may be transboundary in nature like trail smelter case and like we have this pulp mill case also so this is based on uh, one maxim seek utero tuo at alienum non lidas and if we go through the meaning of that maxim roman maxim that says uh, we should act like a, a good neighbor and therefore uh, there are two principles evolved neighborliness good neighborliness principle and no harm principle so we should act a uh, just like a neighbor so every sovereign should work like a good neighbor and they should not harm to the adjacent country here if we talk about the natural resources exploitation of natural resources so uh, every sovereign country has ample power to exploit their natural resources within their territory within their jurisdiction but same time uh, we have our requirement also uh, in terms of environment if we exploit a lot if we, we can harm the our neighbor as well as our domestic people so uh, in the light of same we have adopted uh, the different international document like stockholm conference like uh, uh, rio declaration cvd and the brentland commission report uh, Millennium Development Goal and SDG also. In the series of the documents and what we have adopted are uh, the environmental uh, principles and what are the challenges in India also. For example, our article 51 suggests that we should uh, respect the treaties, conferences, which is done in international perspective. Uh, we have uh, uh, gone through the uh, COP6. COP6 basically is talking about uh, what should be the carbon emission of the country. And we have uh, fixed the boundary line of 1990. Uh, so this is 1990, the year. What was the uh, carbon emission before that? We should go through that demarcated line. And here, the real problem comes before us whether we are following that norms we have enacted uh, the certain kind of this uh, uh, this uh, cop6 and other international document we are emitting less carbon but same time uh, we we have adopted the sustainable development like intergenerational equity intragenerational equity and uh, there are a uh, certain a precautionary principle where we go for public participation also and in this public participation we can go for ADR mechanism also because uh, if we talk about the Arhas convention 1998 and Rio convention and other international document that is prescribing about the public participation in decision making process for environmental matters but same time uh, this will cater two things. It will reduce the environmental harms. It will uh, suggest the fairness and transparency in decision-making process. And same time, if there will be public participation in environmental matters, certainly it will uh, reduce the litigation in environmental matters also. Uh, same time, uh, if we talk about the this kind of environmental impact assessment is done for the large project or mega project, and we take the precautionary approach basically where uh, on scientific uncertainty is there, uh, there is a uh, there can be irreparable losses. So we just go for assessing the project 
through this precautionary approach. But same time, public participation can help us to mitigate those problems. We have witnessed two uh, uh, kind of disaster in uh, like environment directly that is connected with environmental problems, like Fukushima disaster, like uh, Bhopal gas disaster, and. Uh, when we uh, talk about the Bhopal gas disaster, we have the Union Carbide Corporation case versus Union of India. And uh, in that case, we have come across the settlement of uh, the claim settlement of damages for this, uh, this disaster. So again, this has taken a long time, long time for giving such compensation and ADR mechanism can be helpful and where uh, the government of India was parents petri of the, all the victims and here uh, that was due to uh, uh, through that particular legislation we have uh, achieved certain kind of goal to give the uh, compensation but here ADR mechanism can be helpful. ADR mechanism, if we talk about in water dispute, water uh, uh, cases can reduce also. And here, like water dispute, if it is river between two countries and uh, there is uh, some environmental problem can be, dis uh, can be resolved. There are certain example, like in 1988, uh, there was dispute between Israel and Egypt. And that dispute was, uh, resolved by this uh, this uh, ADR mechanism. If we uh, go for like Sardar Sarovan Dam uh, matters in India, uh, there are some other uh, Kaviri River project was there uh, that all were settled in uh, India. Uh, we have two uh, conventions like Helsinki Convention uh, 1992 and uh, United Nations Convention uh, that all are uh, dealing with uh, transboundary water course and international lakes and uh, we can adopt those uh, conventions to resolve uh, certain issues. Uh, when we go for this uh, ADR mechanism, we just apply uh, the arbitration, conciliation and mediation process and certainly uh, it is helpful for where jurisdiction is lacking. Uh, some, uh, uh, I think I may have five minutes more. Uh, sir, it's just uh, two minutes left, sir. Okay, okay. So just I'm okay. just uh, uh, in few minutes I will conclude. Uh, if we talk about like uh, energy sector and uh, infrastructure development, uh, uh, we see the sustainable development uh, is having three type of component: uh, environment, development, and economy. Economy. And uh, when we go for the seven, uh, 17 SDG, all are integrated SDG and we cannot uh, say that one, is, uh, one goal is uh, uh, independent. So whatever we have the SDG uh, uh, goals that can be uh, codified in uh, well-drafted manner and that can be implemented. What we have today legislation that is only dealing with certain environmental issues, water, air and other things, but not in totality, which is uh, dealing with in uh, like human development aspect. So uh, we have another kind of like uh, this uh, act of National Green Tribunal and uh, when AP Pollution Control Board versus Professor M.B. Naidu case was decided, they have suggested there should be uh, there should be some expertise, experts should be there to decide the environmental matters. But right now, uh, that is also not sufficient. So therefore, uh, we should go for such kind of uh, discussion and deliberation, which will discuss, which which can focus. Uh, the our uh, problems, environmental problems in real manner. And uh, I just uh, uh, would like to conclude, but uh, I will take one or two minutes. Uh, there are two things. When we go for the uh, enforcement of SDG, uh, we can adopt the all integrated issues and certainly climate change will come under the picture. Uh, what can be the repercussion if there will be climate change? I'm just concluding, but uh, 
if there will be climate change certainly it may uh, in terms of uh, there may be mass uh, uh, climate conflict there may be due to you know like national uh, uh, this if natural resources loss uh, rehabilitation issues migration issues refugee issue it can be climate crisis also so we just not forget uh, to those issues and uh, uh, simultaneously nowadays consumerism is increase the pollution level also because if we talk about the consumer con uh, this consumerism uh, production level to product level production level to product delivery level we have the carbon emission and other gas emission so this is the reason uh, that commercial aspect has also uh, uh, done some kind of environmental pollution and Canada has just uh, uh, done environmental pollution uh, can be taxed so that is the in in the ambit of tax taxation so we can hear uh, if there is a natural resources is used for commercial purposes then that can be taxed that should be taxed and uh, who is emitting less carbon they should be uh, obviously uh, uh, compensated in other way so thank you uh, thank you and we have certain suggestion but uh, due to lack of time uh, uh, it is but uh, if you permit then i can suggest few things sir you can have few minutes to okay. wind up if you possible okay okay, okay. Thank you, sir. so uh, I would like to enforceability of uh, right of wholesome environment and in enforceability of the integrated SDG, uh, which can have holistic code and there should be uh, environmental tax. And if we talk about uh, there are certain private people who is harming to the environment, if they are harming and uh, victim are the private people that can also be addressed through the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. And next up, we have Ilasara Darisa Karkonor. Ma'am, may you have you, please? Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You're, okay. you're very much audible. OK, thank you. Uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my topic for today's uh, seminar is uh, the relationship between human rights and, in, and environmental rights. So here, the, in recent years, the relationship between human rights and environment issues have uh, become an issue of vigorous debate. The link between the two emphasizes that a decent physical environment is a precondition for living a life of dignity and worth. Uh, the link between human rights and environmental law is gaining recognition in every part of the world. Uh, basic human needs are easily undermined as a result of environmental damage. Um, yes, of course, we know that without a healthy environment, we are unable to fulfill our aspirations. Uh, we can say that environmental rights are an extension of the basic human rights that mankind requires and deserves. Uh, having a safe and sustainable environment is paramount as all other rights are dependent upon it. The human rights and the environment mandate created in March 2012 and extended in 2018 examines the human rights obligations as they relate to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. It also promotes best practices relating the, to the use of human rights in environmental policy making. Human rights and the environment, as we know, are interlinked and intertwined. Right. Human rights cannot be enjoyed without a safe, healthy, clean environment and a sustainable environmental governance cannot exist without the establishment of and respect for human rights. When the environment suffers, people suffer. Climate change increasingly interferes with the realization of fundamental internationally recognized human rights, including the right to life, to health, to culture, to food, to self-determination, to property, and to development. The poorest and the most 
vulnerable always suffers first. But ultimately, the crisis will reach all of us. The importance of the environment to the fulfillment of human rights is widely accepted at international law. It is argued that human rights law can make a positive contribution to environmental protection, but the precise nature of the connection between the environment and human rights warrants more critical analysis. So what is the relationship between human rights and the environment? The relationship between human rights and the environment was first recognized by the UN General Assembly in the late 1960s. In 1972, the relationship between the environment and the right to life was recognized by the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. The preamble stated that man is both creature and molder of his environment which gives him physical sustenance and affords him the opportunity of intellectual, moral, social, and spiritual growth. We have the Stockholm Declaration, which further gave a foundation linking human rights and environmental protection by declaring that man has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. In 1982, the World Charter for Nature acknowledged that humankind is a part of nature and life depends on the uninterrupted functioning of natural systems which ensure the supply of energy and nutrients. In 1992, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, also known as the Earth Summit, stated that human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. The declaration also provided for the right of access to environmental information and of public participation in environmental decision making. In 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development merely acknowledged the position that there exists a possible relationship between environment and human rights. The resolution of the UN Human Rights Commission emphasized the needs of the vulnerable members of the society and also encouraged efforts towards the implementation of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development so as to ensure this right, although there is little evidence of work to make this happen. Over the last year, there has been increasing interest in these issues. There is no doubt that the timing of this activity is appropriate. The 2001 meeting of the UN High Commission on Human Rights has called for an international seminar on these issues. Um, there are two main approaches to human rights and the environment. Um, the use of existing human rights and the need for new rights for a safe and clean environment. The rights that we already have are the civil and political rights, the economic, social, and cultural rights. Such rights include the right to life, equality, political participation, and association. These rights help protect civil mobilization around environmental protection and equity. Social, economic, and cultural rights are often referred to as second generation rights, for they provide substantive substantive standards of an individual's well-being. The International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights provides an example. The covenant provides, amongst others, the right to health, which recognizes the need for environmental improvement. It also provides for self-determination, including the right to all people to manage their own natural resources. These second generation rights often have a direct bearing on the human environment and environmental conditions. Although existing first and second generation rights can provide for a degree of global and environmental protection, if effectively mobilized, they are indirect environmental rights. They therefore suffer from a lack of clarity and precision on environmental protection and equity. What is required to strengthen the use of universal human rights are direct policy, legislation, and institutional changes which recognize a specific right 
to a healthy and sustainable environment and which takes into account both substantive and procedural issues. All human beings depend on the environment in which we live in. The number and scope of international and domestic laws, judicial decisions, economic, uh, sorry, academic studies on the relationship between human rights and the environment have grown rapidly. Many states now incorporate a right to a healthy environment in their constitutions. As a result, in March 2012, the Human Rights Council decided to establish a mandate on human rights and the environment, which will study the human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, and promote best practices relating to the use of human rights in environmental policy making. A human rights perspective, perspective to sustainable development moves from the traditional green issues to a wider approach to protecting the most vulnerable in society. These rights can provide a platform for environmental and sustainable improvements, which are likely to benefit the more and the most marginalized people, that is the poor, women, and the minorities. The human rights perspectives facilitates policies that have a strong impact on poverty and exclusion of, for reasons of gender or race. In India, the chapter on fundamental duties of the Indian constitution clearly imposes duty on every citizen to protect the environment. Article 51A Clause G states that it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. Article 14 provides that the state shall regard the raising of the level of nutrition and the standard of living of its people and the improvement of public health as among its primary duties. The improvement of public health also includes the protection and improvement of environment without which public health cannot be assured. Further, Article, 40, uh, Article 48 deals with organization of agriculture and animal husbandry. It directs the state to take steps to organize agriculture and animal husbandry on modern and scientific lines. Article 48A of the Constitution states that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. The right to environment is also a right without which development of individual and realization of his or her full potential shall not be possible. Articles 21, 14, and 19 of the Constitution have been used for environmental protection. The Constitution, according to Article 21, clearly states that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. Article 21 guarantees fundamental right to life. Right to environment, free of danger of disease and infection, is inherent in it. Right to healthy environment is important attribute to the right to life with human dignity. In India, we have a separate ministry, namely the Department of Environment, which was established in 1980 to ensure a healthy environment for the country. Now, when we talk about a sustainable environment, in simple terms, sustainable or environmental sustainability is the practice of interacting with the planet responsibly. So therefore, it is our responsib responsibility to avoid depleting natural resources and compromising the future generation's ability to meet their daily needs. A few examples of environmental sustainability are solar, wind, hydroelectricity, and biomass. And sustainability in agriculture includes crop rotation, crop cover, and smart water usages, while sustainability in forests Forestry involves selective logging and forest management. Now, what is environmental sustainability and why is it important? Environmental sustainability is the responsibility of all human beings to conserve natural resources and protect global ecosystems to support health and well being for now and for the future. How do we live a more sustainable lifestyle? It is our responsibility to save our mother nature, right? Our earth. So a few examples uh, 
on how we can live a more sustainable lifestyle is number one, to save energy. By using less energy, we can help reduce carbon emissions. By using a re reusable alternatives, by uh, recycling, and by growing our own produce. Um, to articulating a right to a decent or healthy environment within the context of economic, social, and cultural rights is not inherently problematic. Clarifying the existence of such a right would entail giving greater weight to the global public interest in protecting the environment and promoting sustainable development. But this could be achieved without doing damage to the fabric of human rights law and in a manner which will fully respect the wide margin of appreciation that states are entitled to exercise when balancing economic, environmental and social policy objectives. A declaration or protocol on human rights and the environment thus makes sense provided it brings together existing civil, political, economic and social rights in one coherent whole, which, or while at the same time, reconceptualize the language of economic and social rights by bringing the idea of the environment for the common good of all. It would, in other words, recognize the global environment as a public interest that states have a responsibility to protect, even if they only implement that responsibility progressively and in so far as resources allow. We are well aware that climate change, climate change is a global problem. It cannot be easily addressed by the simple process of giving existing human rights law. It affects many states and much of humanity it causes and those its causes and those responsible are too numerous and too widely spread to respond usefully to individual human rights claims therefore the response of human rights law if it has to have one needs to be in global terms by treating the global environment and climate as the common concern of humanity that is why locating the right to a decent environment within the corpus and institutional structures of economic, social, and cultural rights, it makes more sense. In that context, the policies of individual states on energy use, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and deforestation could be scrutinized and balanced against the evidence of their global impact on human, on human rights and the environment. Therefore, in conclusion, we can state that in order to protect our human rights and our environment, it has to come from us. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for delivering such a wonderful speech. And next up, sir, you'd like to make a comment on the uh, research paper? OK. No, no, no comment. Uh, please, please continue. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll comment on all the papers at the last. Okay, okay sir. After this, this will be the last presenter, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So next up, we have Lahun Lang Kurba. Ma'am, we have maybe we have you, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone, to all the participants, and. Uh, I am Lam Langkorba. I am an assistant professor at Long Law College. My topic today is eco-theology, a traditional way of preserving the environment okay. with special reference to the state of Meghalaya. Am I audible, everyone? Okay. Now, firstly, we should understand what uh, by that term eco-theology. Eco what is exactly eco-theology? Eco-theology, it is a form of constructive theology that focuses on the in interrelationship of relation uh, and nature, particularly in the light of environmental concern. Eco-theology starts from the premises that relationship exists between human and religious or spiritual worldviews and the degradation or restoration and preservation of nature. It explores the interaction between ecological values such as sustainability and human dom domination in nature. Okay, first of all, uh, human and environment, they have, they coexist together. They have a relationship. We depend on the environment for food and shelter. And in turn, what do we give to the environment? 
the environment we are living in, we, we ourselves, you talk about what are the issues of the environment. Now, we ourselves, we are, degrade, we are degrading the environment. We are destroying the environment, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me focus on the topic that is a uh, traditional way of preserving with special reference to the state of Meghalaya. Now, when we talk about the state of Meghalaya, the state of Meghalaya is having the... Uh, what we call is sacred groves, okay? In all over the states of Meghalaya, particularly in the, the Khasi, East Khasi Jaintia Hills, East Khasi Hills, the Jaintia Hills, and uh, some places in Garo Hills, we have these forests, we have these groves, what we call the sacred groves, okay? What are these sacred groves? What are these sacred forests? The sacred grove or the sacred forests are any patches of the primeval forest that has that some rural communities okay, protect as an abode of deities. Now, uh, how do how these forests are being protected? Now, they're in a certain community, okay, irrelevant of being uh, irrelevant of uh, any uh, faith, okay. Now, the community come together as a whole, okay, to preserve the the uh, environment, to preserve the forest. Now. When you go to the sacred groove, okay, now uh, I'll share you my uh, personal experience because uh, when we we take we are taking one of the example uh, of uh, Meghalaya, we have in Meghalaya we have a Mauplang sacred groove, okay. Where is this Mauplang uh, situated? It is situated in East Khasi Hills, Meghalaya. Now it is one of the famous famous tourist spot, famous tourist des destination. Now. Uh, this uh, Mauplang sacred groves is known all over the world. Now, as a kid, okay, me and my family, we used to go for a picnic. Almost all the time, we used to go for a picnic. Now, when you go to these sacred groves, these are the protected forests. You cannot pluck even a twig, okay, because it is believed that if you, it is sacred and without the permission of the protector, that forest is being protected. Okay, it is not protected by the community, but there is a protect protector in the form of a deities. All right, now, now uh, we we call these deities the 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 basa or the rinko in a, a local language. We call the basa or a rinko. Now, without the permission of a basa or a rinko, you cannot even pluck one twig from the forest. All right, now. If you have heard of the story, okay, there once upon a time, uh, uh, the what do you call the a group of armies, okay, a group of armies they went for a picnic at Mokha Sacred Group, and they said that okay, this is a folklore story, okay, it is not a folklore story actually. They said that this forest has been protected, okay. Now, if you pluck even a twig. A rinko or a basa, okay, will become alive and they will punish you. Now, this group of armies, they don't believe in such stories. Now, what do they do? They they cut down trees, okay, a truck of trees. Now, on their way, okay, when they started moving from Malflang Sacred Grove, on their way, the truck suddenly stopped. Okay, the truck suddenly stopped. Now, what happened to the to those army who were in the truck? Okay, the story was told that their head overturned backside. All right, now what they do after that? What happened? If anything is such happened in that sacred groove, okay, whatever you have taken from that sacred groove, you are being uh, you are being punished. Okay, now to whom you will go? To whom you will go and tell that you have been punished? Now, like I told you, there is a rinko and a basa. Okay, now without asking permission from the protector himself you cannot take out you cannot cut down trees now what happened if a, if a group of people they go to a picnic okay in the maplang sacred group it is not forbidden it's not prohibited okay to go to maplang for uh, for a picnic or anything like that but then you cannot cut down trees to make fire all right but you can just uh, pick up any any uh, trees that has been fallen down or any uh, shrubs, you can make fire out of that, okay? Now, it is also said that if you go for a picnic, if any kind of animal come to you, okay, any kind of animal will come 
to uh, to uh, where to the area where they're having a picnic you cannot chase away that animal all right you cannot chase away that animal because it is believed that uh, that animal may come to you in a form of a protector okay now how how this sagrat groove till today is standing okay now it is believed that certain uh, cultural traditional and religious rites have to be performed almost every time okay almost every time so that uh, people will not uh, dare to uh, people will not dare to <clears throat> people will not dare to cut down trees will not dare to destroy the forest okay now uh, even the there is no such rules as that a state rule or any central rule is applicable to that forest that if you cut down trees you'll be punished no it is a norm okay it is a norm is a prohibition that has been given by such community which preserve that forest okay now these norms have become so restrictive that not even a person can go and dare to cut down trees or pluck any twig or do anything bad inside the forest all right now my point is that if uh, if we encourage okay if we encourage people all around the world to have that several patches of forest several patches of forest to be preserved under the name of religion or under the name of any certain uh, 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 under the name of religion, under the name of uh, preservation by the communities, and it sh uh, the norm should be strict, and uh, it should be strict, and such norm should be uh, very restrictive that none shall dare to destroy such forests. Okay. Now I believe the sacred roof we have it still prevails in the state of Meghalaya. Uh, uh, any other states we don't have like us. My knowledge, we don't have any such form of sacred groves. <clears throat> now, if the government will take such initiative to encourage any religious groups or any religious community to preserve such uh, forests, okay, not all forests, but only a patch of uh, only a patch of uh, any types of forests, okay. Now, how that would have helped the the world okay that would have helped the world not only in a particular state but everybody it would have helped everybody all the uh, people of the world and we would have not suffered the uh, like we're going now the the crisis we are uh, facing global warming okay now uh, like i said if even if there are state laws and central laws okay the environment protection they are still the wrongdoer okay now in the name of industrialization in the name of modernization trees have been cut down environment has been destroyed now if initiative will be taken by the government awareness to be spread by the government or any other person who believes in the in the preservation of the sacred forest then the government also should encourage such type okay should encourage such type uh, of uh, plantation of or preservation of the patches of forest okay to be go governed by certain religious community or to be governed by uh, a religious group okay because as the topic goes eco theology all right now Eco theology, eco comes comes from the word environment theology. It is a religious, right? It is religious. Now people they lean towards the spiritual side always. Now if any is forbidden by the religion, if any is forbidden by the religion or by any faith you are following, okay, you will not do that, right? Now therefore, if such forest has been preserved. If such forest has been preserved and been and uh, <clears throat> is protected by several communities or several religious community, nobody will dare destroy the environment. All right. See, therefore, my point is that religion and uh, environment. Okay. Now, religion and environment. 
they uh, exist a relationship okay now if we do not protect the environment who will protect the environment if in the name of industrialization or modernization we are destroying the environment therefore in the name of religion we can also preserve the environment all right now therefore my point here is that government should encourage okay government should encourage and should also take example of the area in mokhlang that is the mokhlang sacred groves that to conserve such forests and should also encourage religious groups or religious communities that such forests should be preserved and should be preventing by should be uh, should prevent the <coughs> should prevent the destroying of environment okay now like it is said okay we are modern okay we are modern but then the the our knowledge our intellectual our intellectual it's nothing compared to the primitive person right now okay i understand now we are we are so advanced with the technology digital life and everything but then if you look back to the past okay they don't need uh, they don't need technology looking back to the past now if you see like i told you the moplang sacred group it has been protected since time immemorial okay now if you go to that forest you can see how dense that forest is okay now they don't need a digital life they don't need laws they don't need uh, uh they don't need punishment uh, penalty to punish the wrong doer but the person himself who goes into that uh, into the forest is scared of committing any crime or is scared of destroying the environment okay it uh, it is in the mind of the person that this is a sacred forest it has been protected okay by some superpower now if i go and commit something in the forest which is against the norms and which is against this forest okay what will happen to me now if a person like i told you commit even pluck a twig okay even a pluck a twig and carry it home carry it home now there is always that sense of fear that what have i done this is a protected forest now if i if anything happened to me is it my fault or the fault of the forest now such kinds of question will come into the mind of the people now if such questions will come to the mind of the people that it is automatically creating the fear inside the people that if i go to such forest i cannot destroy the, such forest okay now uh, before like i told you there was no law okay now this is the traditional way of preserving the forest long back before, after, even uh, before coming of the environmental laws how to protect the environment a long time back there is also a traditional way of preserving forests this is one way of preserving the forests okay now if nature is being destroyed okay if nature is being destroyed what will happen to us now forget what will happen to us now what will happen to the a future generation okay we ha- we should not think about what we are doing now we should think about what will happen in the future All right now if we are facing problem with the f- pollution right now if we are facing problem with the global warming right now imagine how will, how the situation will be in the future what will happen to our what will happen to our children what will happen to our grandchildren what will happen to the to their children will they be able to uh, breathe the pure oxygen okay therefore therefore i uh, stress therefore my topic is that uh, i want to do this because it's because i've been there as a child okay i've been visiting such forests and till today i am visiting i am going for picnic with my family but like i told you the government should encourage and should spread awareness okay that there is only there is not only the modern form how to preserve the environment there are also traditional way which can